I, the way I look at the news and the way I teach uh, the folks at Agape is that when you look at that, that's really a prayer request from a sick society. It's not the news. Mm. It's a, a, a diagnosis. It's just like if you go to the doctor, if, you, if your doctor tells you you have something wrong with you and you tell a good friend, the friend will take that news and perhaps pray for you or perhaps give you some information that will help you. So when we look at the news, we're not to take that in as, oh my God, this is real. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Minnie in the house. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. The carnivore diet. Because of what we eat. Honestly, you've really touched my heart. Let me give you a little bit, other than just wanting to, to lean into your wisdom at this time in human history, I really want to give you a little bit of a background in, in um, my following. We have about a half a million people all over the world that fast together yeah. every oh, month. Yeah. So, How many days? Yeah, we do five days and we do different fasts. Mm -hmm. So we really lean into all different types. I've um, really dove into the science of autophagy and and uh, how the body repairs itself while it's fasting. And so as a worldwide community, we really uh, teach the principles to people. And what I love about fasting is that people get the opportunity to really understand how wise their body was designed right. to be. And I, I was last summer watching your Sunday service. And I think it was in August that you said you started to talk about spiritual fasting and how we need to start to fast from more than just, you talked about food, right. but you, you also talked about fasting from the news and fasting from the fear. So I really want to bring that discussion back and have some, some deeper context with that. Give us, you know, right now we're uniting the world, my group, through through physical fasting, but I feel like the world could unite through spiritual fasting. There's a, there's a way for us to come together using that principle, and I'd love to hear your wisdom on I'll it. I'll be glad. I'll be glad to. First of all, when I think about fasting, uh, I, I one, of, one of my names for meditation is mind fasting, in which we are not trying to get content into the mind. We're becoming still enough so that so that the debris, the toxicity, the toxic thoughts, uh, the uh, emotions come to the surface to be released, just as what happens in when you fast from food, you know, you release toxins, you release undigested food, you release things that are no longer necessary for the body. Well, meditation is mind fasting. That's another way of looking at it. Of course, it has its um, aspect of connecting with the divine presence within one, it has its aspects of really uh, stepping out of our present paradigm and seeing reality from a more expanded point of view. But meditation also carries with it the, the elimination of thoughts and perceptions and interpretation of past experiences that hinder our perception from seeing that which is real. I often say that peace and love and harmony and wholeness those qualities are everywhere, except where it's being suppressed by limited perception. So in mind fasting, you're cleansing the perceptual windows so that you can see clearly again. So when you combine that with fasting, you know, physical fasting, uh, the perceptual windows become very, very crystal clear. And you notice that uh, you haven't been experiencing reality You've only been experiencing your thoughts about reality. But with fasting, mm. you actually have direct contact with that which is real. And that changes your life forever. Yeah. Yeah. Or do you fast? I do. I do fast. I used to fast um, uh, quite severely. And I, I shouldn't use the word severely, but I would I'd do seven day fast. I would do 21 day fast, like 40 day fast. You know, over the years, I've been a faster. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm speaking to you, I just got re-inspired to, to do that again. But generally speaking, I'll take a day like a Monday or a day when I don't have a lot of activity and that will be my fast day. But yep. um, yeah. uh, just being in this conversation with you now is reigniting. And I, and I was already thinking about it anyway that I needed to do a good fast. So having a yep. conversation with you is uh, reigniting that, that awareness that it's time for that. It's time for a good house cleaning. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and, and again, what, and, and I'm happy to help you through that process. It's amazing when what we're seeing, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people that are healing themselves. They're like the, the wisdom of their body is healing them. There, there's nothing going in from the outside. And when I parallel that to what the world is going through right now, the outs, when you talk about the perceptions that we're taking on of reality and how fasting can and mind fasting can remove that, we are living in this time of so much fear, so much angst, so much misinformation. Yeah. One, one of the things I wanted to bring you on to help elevate the conversation, how do we write, just like we need to rise above the junk food that we put mm -hmm. in our body, how do we rise above the junk information that is destroying our minds yeah, right absolutely. now? You said, you said a couple of things. First, I want to comment on what you said about the body healing itself. The body's genius. You know, this body yes. temple is a magnificent expression of wisdom and intelligence. And it will heal itself if, in fact, you, you eliminate the toxins and put in the, the living energy that, that is necessary. Uh, oftentimes, as we know, people are uh, going into the, into the um, doctors and things of that particular nature, but they're not participating in any kind of healing. They're participating in the management of pain or symptoms or disease, but they're not allowing the body to heal. So when you say... Uh, you talk about the brilliance and the magnificent of the magnificent of the body temple. I've seen it. You know, I've seen people come back from debilitating diseases, and uh, when the doctor had given up hope, and us working with them and watching the body heal itself. So that's absolutely true, and I, I I've seen it. I've seen the evidence of that. And in terms of um, perception, in terms of mind fasting, you know, people have to realize, for instance. When you look at uh, the news, I, I call the news, it's not really news. It's really, <laughs> it's really the regurgitation of a certain um, thought form that's repeated every single day. The lowest common denominator of the human experience, the next thing to be afraid of, and it's repeated two or three times a day. You'll get a news cycle early in the afternoon, it repeats early evening, it repeats at night, and it almost appears that there's no new news happening between those times because they just repeat it. But people need to understand that, that what they're looking at when they're looking at that, they're looking at a narrow band of reality. It's not reality. It's just a narrow band that's fraught with opinion and points of view, um, malicious hypnotism, uh, mind control, uh, subliminal information to make people worried. Uh, I'm talking about corporate sponsor media and, and a lot of the corporations that sponsor that, of course, are pharmaceuticals. So people get nervous and anxious and then a pharmaceutical commercial comes on. That's not a coincidence <laughs> in order to, mm. to, to mitigate the anxiety or the worry. So people, first of all, understand that that's not news and that's a limit. It's, it's just a small fraction of that which is real and a small fraction of that which is happening on the planet, we look at the news differently. I, the way I look at the news and the way I teach uh, the folks at Agape is that when you look at that, that's really a prayer request from a sick society. It's not the news. Mm. It's, it's a, a, a diagnosis. It's just like if you go to the doctor, if, you, if your doctor tells you you have something wrong with you and you tell a good friend, the friend will take that news and perhaps pray for you or perhaps gives you some information that will help you. So when we look at the news, we're not to take that in as, oh, my God, this is real. We're to take that in as the society is sick. It's run amok with fear and worry, anxiety about viruses, anxiety about hate, anxieties about economics and, and jobs. You know, so the society is going through a period of sickness, toxicity. We don't leap in there and experience that with, with the news. We actually look at it and frame it as, this is what I need to hold in prayer. So that every time that Beautiful. comes to us, we have a challenge to stay up, expanded, affirmative, and prayerful. And what's happening on the planet gives us a lot of practice to stay up and expanded and prayerful. And so I think people have been hypnotized into actually thinking that what they're looking at is real. 
they they have forgotten that those individuals that are reporting 90 percent of them are actors then they haven't done any research they're just re receiving the information that they're to display as a reporter it's not like years ago we actually had the reporters doing the research and then coming back and say this is what i found now most of those people are just actors they just read what they're allowed to say they can't even say their own opinion to uh, or they're overly opinionated based on whatever station you're, you're watching and so if people begin to look at it like that they won't be pulled down in the rabbit hole of the malicious hypnotism that brings about fear because fear is the most potent uh, mind virus. Fear is the most debilitating virus we're dealing with. It's more debilitating than any virus that comes and mutates. We've been dealing with viruses for thousands of years. You know, this, this is nothing new, you know. Yep. Uh, so fear is really the most potent virus. And the news, which I call the O's, foments that kind of fear. Yeah. And and yet if we if you think about the typical person sitting in their home, they've been told to stay indoors and they're watching the news. I love this reframing it as this is where prayer needs to our, put our attention on. But there's this last year, there's been such a huge impact on what people are perceiving as their freedom. Yeah. And yet freedom, from what I've learned from you over the years of listening to you and attending revelations and listening to my mom who's learned from you, is that freedom is you, starts in your mind. Yes. It doesn't start in your physical place. Yes. So help us, if let's put ourselves in the shoes of that person who feels stuck. Yeah. How do we give them freedom back? Well, freedom, as you're indicating, is intrinsic to us. It's, it's been given to us as we, were, as we emerged from the eternal. And it's a state of awareness that one gets through being interested in it. First, there must be interest. And then there must be uh, the belief that freedom is there. Belief then creates a level of practice, affirmative prayer, meditation, study, conversations with high-minded people podcasts such as this and, and freedom then begins to be activated and then you begin to discover that no one can steal this expanded space the world can't take it the, uh, the world can't since the world didn't give it to you the world can't take it away from you and you start to live in an expanded state of freedom now what are the ramifications of that uh the wisdom the guidance and the direction that's always flowing you begin to hear it in a language in a way that you can understand and then you are guided to do and to be what is necessary for your safety your protection your peace and your well-being they use the word quarantine quarantine is not really the right word because you quarantine people who are sick you don't quarantine people who are health or healthy uh, what we're really facing is more like a house arrest you know it's not like a quarantine and, and it's not really safer at home because ever since they put the nation under house arrest, there's been more suicides, there's been more alcoholism, there's, there's been more uh, pharmaceutical usage, there's been, there's been more depression, there's been more sickness because people's immune system is not activated because they're staying in house all day. So, yep. uh, so, so the, the language of, of safer at home is actually a lie. You know, no one's safer at home. However, you can be safe in your home if you have your intrinsic freedom activated, you know. And again, the virus of fear must be dissolved and you must have an, an, an intention and a belief, an intention to be free, a belief that freedom is, is, is within you. And you must have some kind of practice, some kind of self-talk, uh, some kind of practice where your self-talk is bigger than the talk you're getting from the world. In other words, mm -hmm. you're not trying to convince the world of anything. You're convincing yourself that you are safe, that your life has meaning, that that you're free. And then, I, I, you know, for me, the past year, I haven't experienced um, any kind of quarantine or any. I haven't experienced any of that. It, it, it's, you know, I've stayed at home, uh, obviously more. You know, but there's, there's more time to meditate, there's more time to study. 
I, there's been more time for me to hang with my family. My, my son is overjoyed. My daughter is overjoyed because they get to see their dad more often. You know, um, I still go where I want to go. I do what I want to do. And uh, I'm not, since I am not interested in disease, disease isn't interested in me, you see. And, I love it. And uh, you experience what you're interested in. If you can remember uh, Shakespeare's powerful statement that a, a coward dies a thousand deaths, meaning whatever you're afraid of, you create all kinds of scenarios within your mind and you experience those scenarios, even if those scenarios don't even come true. You live them. The coward is dying a thousand times, you know, so I'm not interested in all of that. I'm interested in peace. I'm interested in love. I'm, I'm interested in safety. I'm interested in wellness. I'm interested in well-being. And that's what my experience has been. I just got my um, labs back from my medical doctor. I needed to do a full makeup because of uh, an up level of, of insurance for, for agape. And uh, he went down. He says, you know, your prostate is like a 20 year old. You know, you have no cancer markers in any of these sections here. You, you know, he just went down this list. He said, you know, you, your, your, your body temple is the body temple of a very young man, you know. Love it. And my testosterone was off the chart, you know. And, uh, uh, and I, cause I live a certain way. I think a certain way. I eat a certain way. I exercise a certain way. And I don't allow the stress of the world to become to become distress within me. And I'm not a special person. I don't yeah. think there are special people. I think there are people who specialize. You know, if you specialize in playing the piano, you'll learn how to play the piano. It's not a special person that's playing the piano or the saxophone. You know, you learn, you, you have a very powerful skill as a chiropractor. You had to study, you had to practice. You specialized so that you can assist people back to a level of wholeness. Somebody else can't do that because they haven't specialized in that, you see. So I'm not a special person, but I have a level of practice that keeps me interested in wholeness. I'm not interested in disease. I have no interest in it whatsoever. Doesn't mean I'm ill-informed. I'm definitely mm -hmm. informed, but I'm not informed to the degree that I'm going to succumb to fear about it. I'm going to succumb to proper hydration, proper supplement supplementation with vitamin D and C and, and zinc and systemic enzyme. You know, I know what to do. Right. And I'm going to, yep. I'm going to live that. And, 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 you know, I've had two tests over the last week, both negative. I had to fly out of the country, negative going in, negative coming out, negative coming into LA. You know, I have no interest in it. And so my body reveals what I'm interested in. And so that's, yeah. what, that's what I implore people to do. Get interested in your health. Get interested in the genius of your body. Get interested right. in your mind. Get interested in what you say to yourself. You say, yeah. All of that. Do you ever, do you ever get doubt? I had this, this moment because the one thing I've been so grateful for over the last year is my belief in the human body. Cause I, I'm really resonating with what you're saying. Like I have days where I go, Oh, we're in a pandemic. I, I forgot. Like, cause I'm the same way I move around the world without fear. Yeah. And then I have moments where something gets me wrong. And all of a sudden I start thinking, and I was saying, you know, my parents, and I was saying something to my 84 year old dad one day about like, okay, should we be testing? What should we be doing? And he stopped me and he looked at me and he said, I'm not fearful about it. So why would you be fearful about it? And he said the same thing you just said. He goes, I'm, this is not my, my infection to die from. Right. So that, so then we actually went and ran his, his vitamin D. Right. So check this out at 84 years old, the man has a vitamin D level of 48, which is <laughs> high. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't even take a supplement. Yeah. He kind of goes out in the sun, but he has such a clear healing attitude that I swear his vitamin D levels are that high. That's that. So, his, 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 you, you, as you know, your body, it's its own pharmacy. So the tonic chemicals flow from your attitude. You know, you go into fear, you produce cortisol. You know, you deplete your immune system. You go into joy and happiness, serving others, praying for others, loving others then the tonic chemicals flow. So your father is an example of the body temple, the chemicals in the body temple and the hormones actually matching his attitude. You know, consciousness precedes form. So consciousness is first, 
the attitude, our perceptions, our beliefs, then it manifests. So it manifests in your bo dad's body as proper supplement, supple su proper hormone of vitamin D. You know, this yeah. is exactly what we're talking about. The the uh, see, I think that we're actually it's not really a pandemic. We're in it. It's what, what we're what we're experiencing is endemic, and that is the American population is very sick. Ever since the rise of fast foods, you know, there was a, a spike in sugar and fast food intake. There was a spike in cancer, spike in diabetes, spike in heart attacks, spike in obesity. So the 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 coronavirus has just revealed what was endemic already in the American population. And I think people, Agreed. you know, we have to have a context for that. I mean, the news gives you, again, a narrow band, and they'll talk about every single day, COVID, 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 COVID. But they're not letting you know the context that six to 800,000 people die every year of a heart attack, cancer, 600,000, uh, doctor's mistakes, four or 500,000. Uh, diabetes, yep. obesity related issues, COVID's down at six or seven for just one year for maybe 400,000 people in America, that is. These other sectors, people are dying every single year. So the, and, and no one, and very few people die from COVID, they die with COVID, you know. Agreed. It's endemic, something else is happening. But if you would look at the news, you would actually become very frightened at this virus and we're not even yep. grieving the people who are dying of a heart attack right now or suicide or cancer. That hasn't stopped. That has not stopped. Yep. And so it's in, we're living in a, in a cesspool of toxicity. People's diets are crazy. They're not walking around the block. They're not breathing. They're glued to the news. They're producing cortisol. They're nervous. The doctors should be saying you brought up vitamin D instead of telling people to wait for a vaccine. And I'm not anti-vac or anything like that. I'm not pro or anti. I'm, I just use my own wisdom. Um, they should be mandating vitamin D. Agreed. They should be mandating vitamin C. They should be mandating some Agreed. level of exercise. They should be mandating some level of zinc. Your zinc quotient should, should be up there as well and, and other things. But they never mention that. That's yeah, a, a disservice agreed. to our society. When a, yeah, a man, agreed. when, a, when a, a, a man, a people of that authority aren't telling people to check their vitamin D levels, you know. Yeah, it, agreed. It's not there. I actually came up with the idea that if when you put the mask on, make it a reminder to keep the junk out. Like use it as a symbolism for yourself every time you put it on that, you know, don't think of it like you're keeping the virus out. Keep it as a reminder that you're keeping the soda out and you're keeping the fast food out. It's blocking that. And I also want to add to that list to in, just to inspire you to fast even more. <laughs> there is There are two systems in which uh, our body operates from, and I'm sure you know this. One is the sugar burner system and one is a fat burner yeah. system. And viruses don't have an energy of their own. So they have to live off your cellular energy. That's right. So if they come into a, your energy and you're a sugar burner, they go into your cells, they gain momentum and they replicate. But if they go into a fat burner energy source, they literally die. There's no, they can't gain any energy. Right. So m one of my feelings is not only if we fast, intermittent fast, a couple of days fast, if we get people to teach them how to fast, we're not only going to help them on a health level, but we're also going to help them on a spiritual level, as to your point. Absolutely. So you're, you're, you're basically it, saying that the virus is opportunistic. It's looking for a host because, as you say, it can't create the condition. It has to find the right condition to survive. And if you have toxicity and the pH is off and you have sugar, it's going to find a host. If you don't, it's going to go. It's going to die. So we have to take responsibility for that. We can't wait for the government to do that. We yep. have to take responsibility for our own body. Yep. Min mind fasting and physical fasting. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. I'm, I'm with you. So on this, on, this fear, on this fear piece, it, what I also feel like is we got real sideways in 2020 as a, as a humanity that we became not only so fearful of the virus, 
But then we started to point fingers at everybody who was thinking different from us. Yeah. And I loved, I was listening this Sunday to your sermon, which I want to encourage all of my community to go listen to you. I, you have three services on Sunday, and I swear each one's different. I could listen to, to each one. But you said something about we, we have to go to this place um, where we love our way out of this moment. Yeah. But how do we do that when our neighbor is not getting vaccinated, the other neighbor is not vac uh, masking, and the other neighbor voted for the person I disagree with? <laughs> how do we <laughs> elevate ourselves? Yeah, I was saying that we have to love our nation back to sanity, you know. That was it. That was it. Yeah. It was so good. We do have to love our nation. Yes. Love and mother our nation back to sanity. There used to be a moment where there was much more civil discourse, which meant yep. we didn't have to agree but we could still love each other and still, you know, even, even, you know, you look at the uh, 60s, 70s, you saw the, the Democrats, the Republicans, they didn't, they, they just, one stood for business, one stood for the yep. concerns, but it wasn't, but they, they always met in the middle to pass laws. They didn't agree. Agreed. They were just representing their constituency. Nobody was wrong. You know, there was just different aspects of society people were concerned with. But something has happened that is called the great polarization, you know, so that now, if in fact, I don't agree with you, I don't like you. <laughs> yeah, right. That, or you're a bad person. You're a bad person you're a bad, because we yep. disagree, or we see things yep. differently. That's a sign of, of emotional immaturity. It's like junior high school. It's like, there's been a reversion back to a junior high school mentality. And you can see it in the streets. You can see the people overthrowing the Capitol and you can see that junior high school cussing each other out and I'm right and you're wrong and you guys are idiots. You know, you can see it, yep. all of that. And, and what, what I say is one, when we see that behavior, we have to understand that those are our younger brothers and sisters. You know, you have to, if you have a brother or a sister and they're much younger than you and they're doing things that are very immature, you don't hate them. You just realize that they're going through a particular stage of maturation. They haven't caught up to where you are right now in terms of your wisdom, your patience, your honesty, whatever the case may be. So we have to begin to look at individuals who are haters, you know, who, who are deep into polarization as our younger brothers and sisters. And we have to draw the circle big enough within our awareness. We don't have to, that doesn't mean agreeing with somebody. It means drawing the circle big enough that you don't keep them out of your heart. So, and it's, it's really, I think, significant that at this particular moment, we're in the beginning of what is called the season for nonviolence, um, yep. in which we're honoring ahimsa and harmlessness and nonviolence under the aegis of Mohandas K. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. And this is a time for honest and um, harmless and nonviolent conversations with each other. Uh, you have to have, you have to have the strength to be able to maintain dialogue with someone that disagrees with you. It takes a strength because it's easy to say, "Oh, they're an idiot. I'm not going to talk to them." That's that doesn't take any strength. That there's no strength or courage in resignation and giving up. Strength and courage comes through being able to stay in that tension and still have the conversation without calling the other person an idiot, you know, or, or, or you know, whatever name we, people have a tendency to call each other these days. So here's, here's the, the litmus test. If whatever it is that you believe, if it is devoid of love, love of humankind, love of the planet, love of each other, then you're probably going down the wrong track. There is no path without love that is sustainable for the planet, sustainable for the nation, sustainable for your family. If love is not the ethic, then you're basically running on opinion and you're running on the, the pollution of uh, fumes of separation. And so we have to stop. We have to get a real sense of what love is. And we have to, we want to build our nation with love and we want to love ourselves and our nation and our world back to sanity. And it's interesting that the word sanity and the word enlightenment mean the same thing in certain spiritual teachings. And when one talks about enlightenment, they're, all, they're, absolutely, they're talking about being sane and not being caught up in the thought forms 
of separation that move through the human consciousness. You become sane and you're like, oh my God, I suddenly see where I was blind. I've come back home, I'm, I'm sane again. You see, I was, I was way out there with hate and belligerence and I was right, you know, uh, self-righteousness, you know, <laughs> seriousness. Yeah. But, but I, wow, I was insane. I've come back to sanity. And, and, and I, I, I want to build my world. I want to build my world with love, you see. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, when you say strengthen, do you think love is like a muscle that you've got to keep working on? I, because, that, that, like, I hear your words, and then I watch how the world is behaving, and I don't see that. And I think, okay, I want to, if I go to Gandhi, and I think be the change, you know, that you want to see in the world, so I need to show up as love. Yeah. And then if I show up as love, will I lift the people around me? These are deep questions I've been asking myself this year is what part can I personally play yeah. in creating more love? There, there, there's love is everywhere. And the, the muscle that we're creating is the willingness to allow it to flow through us even when we don't feel like it. It's, it's easy if you're hanging around your family, you know, people that you like. It's easy to love people that you like, you know. Yeah. But we have to become strong enough to let the love flow when we consider the people that we disagree with, that's where the work is. That's the advanced class. You know, the, 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 the easy class is, is, is to love people that you like. The advanced class is, to, and I don't mean um, emotional love. I'm not talking about sentimental love. I mean, I'm not even talking about friendship. You know, we're talking about, um, you know, Dr. King's phrase is, uh, it's the love of God operating in the human heart. You're not cutting anybody outside of your heart, which we both noticed people doing this past year. People yeah, actually yeah. cutting a large swaths of the population out of their heart as, you know, we've even heard Congress people talking about assassinating people and, and killing people and things and yeah, yeah. going to go hang somebody. I mean, it's gotten, it's gotten to that level of, uh, of, of hate and unconsciousness that these individuals' emotions are running away with them. They have no sovereignty over their awareness. You see, they just have gotten into the, um, the cycle of self-righteousness and to be able to, even if they didn't mean it, but to be able to say something publicly like, they should be hung or, you know, we got to go kill them. You know, that is, uh, that soul has been uh, devastated and shrunk. So the individual has to come back just to basic fundamental teachings of love your neighbor with the awareness that your neighbor is not the person living next door to you. The neighbor is anyone on the planet, you see. And, that, and, and again, that's a practice. It seems uh, almost foolish, and, but we will destroy ourselves unless there's enough people that rise up and love at that level and then seek to build uh, their communities and their nation from the awareness of love, not from the awareness of self-righteousness or partisan politics. I mean, and again, even, even the political system is a narrow frequency. I mean, that's, you can even fast from that for a while, um, even, uh, though, definitely, even, definitely. Because even though they represent the people, um, most of the time, great changes in society does not come from politics. It comes from what's trending with people. And then the politicians later on get in front of it or embrace it as the next wave. But you never get anything revolutionary or creative out of Washington, D.C. or out of any particular Congress people. I mean, there are exceptions. But generally, you're not going to get anything creative out of a person. You know, they're in a system. Everything creative or new comes from people. It comes from innovators, artists, social entrepreneurs, uh, uh, individuals who are on the edge of living a higher vision, and then then they pull society with them. But it's not going to come out of politics. Yeah. But you definitely do not allow that to be any kind of authority over you. You have to have authority and sovereignty over your own being. Those people, they work for you. And people have forgotten that, and they think they're working for the government, you know, that the government yeah, yeah. has some kind of power over you. The government, they work for you. You pay their salaries. 
You tell them that's what right. to do. That's you write right. them a letter. You tell them how you want to be represented. But you have to know yourself in order to do that. You have to feel some level of power and love in order to sit down and email or write a letter and say, I like this. I don't like this. I want you to speak more about this. They work for you. And people have forgotten and they've given up their sovereignty and their power. You see. Do, do, you, do you think social media is causing part of the problem? I think social media um, um, is neutral, but it, just like anything, it can be used by nefarious means or it can be used for inspiration. So people now can just dump their hate in there, remain anonymous and get people all caught yeah. up in arguing. Other people are using social media for inspiration, you know, for prayer, for tra transformation. And what people need to, going back to fasting, people have to realize that they might be addicted to drama. And, and they're looking for the next dramatic thing to get all riled up about because they're addicted to the to toxic chemicals that are flowing through the body, you know. They, they, there's a statement, you know, uh, that, that says, um, you know, I think, therefore I am, but, but it has morphed into, I have drama, therefore I am, you know what I mean? And so, uh, social media is concerned, every, it's a mixed bag, everything is in social media. And people have to take responsibility to not go down the rabbit holes of hate and the rabbit holes of drama and separation. And if you go on social media, you know, find those uh, outlets that are actually giving you real information, giving you real science, giving you real inspiration, what prayer can do, what meditation is, what art is, you know. And so, yeah, uh, agreed. Yeah. So people have to look at what I'm saying. People have to actually look at it and see what they're addicted to. You see? Yeah. 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 Agreed. <laughs> and do you think that the, you, the health of our world, like when we look at the junk food we put in our body, it creates junk thoughts. Yes. And then you, on top of that, you put the fear of a virus and then you put social media and you put politics and we're easily spun up because of the way that we take care of our health. And it starts, a big piece of this starts there. Yeah, if you're throwing junk food in your body, it's turning to sugar. You drink alcohol, it turns to sugar. You lose coherence in your thinking. The hemispheres don't talk to each other anymore. You, you think you're thinking, but there's no real coherence there. And so the deep wisdom and the intuition is hindered. And you're actually living as a reactor. You're a reactionary. You're not a responder from a higher principle or a higher presence. You're actually reacting to circumstances, which is right. like a waste of your infinite potential. You know, we have infinite potential, all of us. And people are only using a little bit of their potential because most of their life is reacting to something outside of themselves and being triggered by something they don't like. And some yeah, people... Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll say that, you know, a pet peeve is something that someone loves to hate, meaning when they find that thing that they hate, they get excited about it. You know, so they'll, mm -hmm. they'll go and look for something that they hate. Oh, did you hear what so-and-so said? Oh, did you hear, what, did you hear what she did? You know, they love to find something that they hate. They're churning out toxic chemicals. They're addicted to them. But the ego is satisfied because they have found their pet peeve. We have to rewire the brain. We have to actually look yep. for things we love, for real. Yeah. Beauty. I've been working on this thought that if we know staying at home and watching the news is be creating more harm, then we need to step out of that place. But freedom exists in our mind. So on my end, I'm teaching people the power of their own yes. body. And when I look at people like you, you're teaching this idea of the freedom of your own mind through prayer and through practice. And I, and I, I love the application of that. How do we give people tools other than you're everywhere and I just am so grateful. You're on I, Instagram, you've got an app, you've got teachings. I feel like we need to, if we're gonna love the world back to sanity, we need to immerse them 
in cultures and thinking where they 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 have no choice but to elevate their frequency. You're speaking my language. One of the things that I've taught over the years is spiritual community grants you immunity from the lower frequencies yeah. of life. So you have to uh, you have to become conscious as to who you're talking to every single day. What kind of conversations Agreed. are you having? Are you in a good spiritual community? Do you have a, a group of people that you can talk to that want to stay elevated and stay out of fear? Or, or when you go into fear, you do have a group of people you can call and say, hey, I fell down the rabbit hole today and they can help pull you out. So community, real, real good, uplifting spiritual community grants you immunity from the lower frequencies of life. Because we're talking frequency, we're talking vibration. So your self-talk and how you talk with each other has to be of a much higher frequency. So, you know, I tell people, you know, tune in uh, to something that's going to inspire you. Uh, go outside, put your feet on the ground, not cement, on mm. the actual Mother Earth so that it will disperse energy uh, from the bottom of your feet to Earth. You know, you'll, you'll actually, you know, you'll ground yourself to Mother Earth, whose frequency is very high, it's very healthy. Walk around the block. People would forget mm. that if you walk around the block, you create more killer cells. Your immune system becomes stronger. Mm. I was reading an article yep. where, um, uh, no, uh, no, I was talking to Sean, Steve, Sean Stevenson. Do you know Sean? Yeah, I heard your Instagram live. It was yeah, really yeah, good. He's a good friend of mine, and we were having a conversation, and he was mentioning that there's a new um, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, a, a new, what do you call it, a new drug that's going to be coming out that increases your killer cells. But it doesn't increase the killer cells more than you walk around the block one time. <laughs> you know, so why yep. would you take something, a chemical that has an effect, a side effect, when you just walk around your block? Same thing. Agreed. So, you know, so, so one, you know, mind fast. Two, intermittent fasting. Three, and this is not in any particular order. You know, this, this, this is the order I'm telling you. You know, make yep. sure you put your feet on the soil every single day. You know, four, walk around your block. If people are nervous, wear your mask, you know, and then pull it down a little bit so you can get some air, then put it back up, pull it down, get some air, put it back up, you know. Uh, if you're not, if nobody's on the block, pull it down, take some nice deep breaths. Um, you put your hand in the soil so you can get some new microbes so that your immune system stays strong because your immune system will get weak if you don't use it. So if you're, if you're staying inside all the time and you're not getting any new uh, microbes in your, in your nostrils or in your hands, you know, then your immune system goes to sleep. So this is why, Agreed. why I told little kids to eat dirt. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> and, and so, you know, we don't, we don't want to be so over sanitized that we put our immune system to sleep. And yeah, you know, that's what I, I told my mom that when we first when the pandemic first hit, I said, she loves to garden. I said, you're going to go outside and you're going to rub, get in the garden and rub that dirt all over you. I don't want you to have your shoes on. I don't want gloves like I want you to get in the yeah. dirt. And if you have to do it naked, do it naked. Like you just got to get out there in the sun and you, your whole immune system will benefit from that experience. Exactly. And people are trying to do the opposite. They're over sanitizing right. everything and to the point where the, the immune system is uh, not being used. It's, you have, it's not, you, just like you have to exercise a muscle or atrophy, yep. the immune system does the same thing. And, and so, you know, this, this is stuff that people will forget or can't hear if they're in fear. You know, when you look at your faith in just the freedom that we can have in the human spirit when we believe. And then I mix that with my faith of what the body is capable. I just, there's, if we all embodied that, we'd be out of hey, this. The body temple is genius. I, I was working with a young lady. I'm still working with her, but a good friend of my daughter's, my daughter came to me and said that uh, her friend, she's like a niece, you know, she was dying. She had stage four cancer through her body and breast colon. And she said, Dad, will you go help her, you know? And so I said, okay, you know, so we go over to her house. And the first thing I said to her is, do you want to live? Do you have an agreement? Are you ready to go over? 
doctors said she had a couple of months to live. Do you want to, you want to stay? She said, no, I want to stay. I said, you really want to stay? She said, yes, okay. So I gave her the, uh, some passages out of a book to read. I said, I need you to read this every single day to have your mind prepared for, for healing. Mm. And I just shifted her diet and gave her certain things to take every single day. You know, a little bit of time. I didn't pour every kitchen sink on her. Just a little bit until now she has a nice regimen that I have her on. And so I get these pictures last week. She's in Joshua Tree. She was on a cane you know, a couple of months ago. And the doctors had given up. They said, nothing you can do. Please go in the hospice. She's in Joshua Tree running around, you know, with her, with her dog and having a great time. And her body's healing in so many ways, you know. The body will heal anything. If you take out the bad stuff, put in the good stuff, and have a right frame of mind. And so her yeah. cancer is just disappearing. And then, Love it. And people... You know, they were calling her all sad. And she's like, hey, how you doing? You know, <laughs> the Love it. you know, because the therapist that they assigned to her was saying, you're not really facing reality. You know, you, you, you know, you're going to be gone in a month and you need to get your affairs in order. And she says, I'm not going anywhere. And she, that was like six, eight months ago, you know, but she's already proved the therapist wrong. You know, oh, I just I, we there's stories like that everywhere. And if you immerse yourself in them, you'll That's see what them. I say. I say, what if? On the news, every single day, instead of getting the figures of unemployment and the figures of, of, of you know, mor morbidity, we actually heard, look at all these remissions that happened today. Look at all these healings. Look at all these healings in relationships. Look at all these forgivenesses that have taken place during this attack. You know, the mind would start to be available to that reality. We start to live in it. We start to look forward and then we would help manifest it faster. Instead of the opposite, you get the lowest common denominator of the human experience. And so your mind uh, becomes addicted to that frequency, and then you assist in the manifestation of that reality. Even if it doesn't happen, you still experience it with your fear. You know? yep. So it's the wrong, just like you asked about social media, that's the wrong use of technology. To flood people's mm. living rooms with fear every night. That is mismanagement, nefarious malicious hypnotism, and it should stop. Yeah. Ah, oh, amen. Amen. So, okay, I have a five final questions for you, what I call my rapid fire, yeah. but sometimes they don't always turn out rapid fire. Um, and so uh, I just to, so that we can dive a little deeper into who you are, which uh, I will do an intro for my group if people aren't familiar with your teachings. Um, my first question for you is, what's the longest you fasted? Uh, 40, 40 days. 40 uh, days. What, what, what was your aha from that? What did you gain from that? That I was not my body and that I wasn't even my mind. I got into a greater awareness that I was and that I am awareness itself. I also became keenly aware that whatever you need to know, if you ask, it will come to you in a language in a way that you can understand. I also discovered that I could have boundless energy without food. You know, it's like all this energy and all of this think, clear thinking and productivity was happening and without food, it was, it was great. That, that was many years ago. I haven't done a 40 day fast in years, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if I can do one now at that, with the, my output of energy that I have now, but I can do modified fasting. I, I, can, I can easily do seven. I can do a three, yeah. you know? I can yeah. do once a week. I can do those, but I don't, I'd have to, I think, go away now. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. They, I did a five-day, I've done several five-day water fasts, and I was teaching the principles of fasting to my community, and I knew they might have some challenges grabbing the information, so I decided I'm going to fast for five days, and on the fifth day, I'm going to present the science behind fasting, and I'm going to reveal to them that I haven't eaten in five days. Mm. And it was really powerful paradigm shifting because I didn't look exhausted. I was actually flying high and was really, you know, at my best. And it really gave people a visual of what can happen when you fast. So I absolutely agree with that you. Okay, really the nice. sex. That Say that again. Day, you know, and then you go like, this, like you don't want to ever eat again, you know. <laughs> no. And, and you get insight yeah. like you could not believe. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. I can't even imagine the insight you would get. Me. I'm eat with today. Today is uh, 
Thursday. Okay, I'm going to eat today because my meal's already been ordered, but I'm not going to eat tomorrow. And I'm really beautiful. Tomorrow. I love it. I love it. Okay, my second question, and this was inspired my, by my dad. My dad said, you have to ask him what health gadget is he into because he's always into some kind of health gadget. Oh, health gadget. I use, um, um, <clears throat> I meditate with these um, very strong magnets that, that you, mm. you stand on. And I do this Qigong uh, movement and breath. And I stand on these magnets for a minimum of eight minutes. And, and so there's a magnetic field that's going up through my meridians. And, um, you know, like a cancer cell cannot thrive in a strong magnetic field, you know. Um, and certain diseases cannot thrive in, in a strong magnetic field. And so I have that. I've had that for a while, but I got some new ones. Um, okay. Right now, I don't know if I have any new gadgets because I'm in between houses. Uh, my house is being okay. constructed that I'm about to move into. So I'm in an, uh, a nice apartment. Where I don't have all my stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. those, yeah. those, well, those magnets are good. I'll give you one. Do you know about the Whoop band? Whoop? What yeah. Is that? It's a band that goes on your wrist and it measures your sleep. It measures your heart rate variability. It tells you your activity level throughout the day, respiration rate. Uh, so it gives you, it's like, it's like a Fitbit on steroids. Uh, I, I've heard about them. I don't have one. No. Yeah. Well, there you go. You'd love it. You'd love it. So, Okay, my next question, you definitely, one thing that I've been uh, impressed with you over the years is that what you teach, you live. And uh, obviously from a spiritual level, but also a physical level. So you have a lot of health habits. Yeah. What do you think other than what you just described to us, what do you think is like the most important health habit you do every day mm -hmm. to give you the blood work that you just got and the vitality that you have? Well, the, the, the three modes of exercise that I do when I, when I, when I can't swim is um, yoga, um, lightweight lifting, and running, not Beautiful. sprinting necessarily. Uh, yep. sometimes intermittent, but I do, I do, and I do, um, I go to the gym every single, uh, six days a week. I have a trainer Beautiful. and we do, you know, obviously a different part of the body every, every day. And then I have a yoga practice. And uh, so I have my flexibility and I have my strength and, and my it. cardio. I like to stand on my head. I like to put my legs up the wall, uh, particularly if I travel, I put my legs up for like 30 minutes. So my organ love it. Um, yeah, that, I, I've had I've done that for years. I've, I, I psychologically, if I don't do something physical every day, I'll be a little off because it's such a part of my my. Yeah. It's not like a lifestyle; it's a way of living. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, love it. If you could go back to the January twenty twenty version of you last year at this time, well, we're in February now, and really knowing what we know from last year and you were giving a sermon to your community, what would you say to them in preparation for what was the year was going to hold? I would probably give them the same talk that I did in March, which was the greatest virus is the virus of fear. And I, I really went into how the previous viruses, the SARS, N1, H1, all those viruses are still here. They didn't go anywhere. We're no longer interested in them, but now we're interested in, in this virus and its mutation. So we're experiencing it on a communal level, even if we don't catch it. And so I did a whole talk around that before I even knew how it was going to exacerbate and become a really big thing. I mean, intuitively, I knew it was. Intuitively, I knew where it was going. But before I, I really had the physical evidence of that, you know, I actually reminded people about the greatest virus is the virus of fear and how to mitigate that. And some of the conversation we're having today, I would probably just repeat that to the best of my ability mm -hmm. because it fit. I, you know, I was in India and when I came back to America in March, I, I, when I left India, I was on the last or the second to the last plane that could leave the country. So I landed in America when all of that stuff started. And I just watched people take what I call the nightmare pill down mm -hmm. this, take this peel and go into a nightmare of, of fear. Well said. And I did my best as a spiritual teacher to keep them out of that. 
you know. Yeah. Um, and in in my community, you know, much of them are not in that nightmare field. You know, they're not Love they're it. not being you know they're being cautious, they're being safe, they're doing you know proper protocols, but they're not living in fear. You know. Love it. Yeah, we all need to take that pill. Okay, last question. If you had one message for the world that you could get into everybody's brain and help them rise above the moment, what, what would that message be? Something along the lines of what their real identity is. That many people think that they are their constellation of shifting personalities. Personalities were born as a reaction to circumstances. Underneath the personality is a presence of luminosity and brilliance and light and love. It's eternal. It carries so much power and so much wisdom. I would want people to know that they really are what is underneath the personality. And, 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 you, and with, with prayer and even fasting, you, you, you get those insights. With prayer, fasting, with meditation, you actually uh, see the difference between the content of the personality flowing through your awareness and who you are as awareness. Let me just give you a quick analogy. Mm -hmm, please. Ocean, we have the grand ocean, whatever, one part of this, the world is called the Atlantic, one part is called the Pacific, you have this great ocean. And then you have the content of the ocean. You have plastic, you have pollution from human beings, you have boats, fish, plankton, seaweed, that's content. But all that content is not the ocean. The ocean is the ocean, and then there's content. So we are awareness, and we have content. Those contents are beliefs, fears, doubts, worries. The moment we realize that that's content and not who we are, that's the beginning of freedom. Because mm, you're able to look at love it. it. You're able to say, oh, uh. there's fear. You, don't, you won't say, I'm, I'm sad. You won't say, I'm fear. You'll say, there it is and you start to create a little gap and then you come into a sense of freedom you're not denying that there's sadness there but it passes through faster because it's, you're not identifying with it so freedom as you're indicating is intrinsic to us it's it's been given to us as we were as we emerged from the eternal and it's a state of awareness that one gets through being interested in it first there must be interest and then there must be uh, the belief that freedom is there. 